Praise God. Get your Bible in your hand as we prepare our hearts tonight for the life-changing, life-giving Word of God. Let's have our confession. Let your heart agree with it. Say, this is my Bible. I can have what it says I can have. I can be what it says I can be. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive to receive the life-changing, life-giving Word of God. I will never, 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 never be the same again. Now look at your neighbor say, neighbor, the Bible is God's Word speaking to you. So listen up and smile real big and get real happy because you look so much better when you're happy. Hallelujah. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's begin tonight in Matthew 24. If you're familiar with that passage, you know it is Jesus talking about end times. But my intent tonight is not to teach on end time events, but to pull out some of the things that Jesus was talking about here and equip you with some knowledge that you need to be victorious in the season in which we live. We live in the last days. If you have any confidence in the written word of God, you cannot look at what's happening in the world and looking what's happening on the world stage and walk away with any other conclusion other than that we are seeing the signs of the times. The day you and I live in is not like previous generations. Things have changed. Things have changed. And we're seeing signs, indications, things that Jesus said would happen in the last generation, and we're seeing it happen. But I want to bring your attention to something very specifically that Jesus said in verse number 11. He said, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Many false prophets. That's people preaching false truths. Many will rise up and they're going to have a big impact. They will deceive many. And Jesus goes on to say in verse number 24, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So the last generation is a generation of great deception. And so if you say we live in the last days, you could also say that we live in, in times of deception. Which, if Jesus gave us such explicit warnings that there would be great deception at the time of the end, then you and I ought to be equipped to overcome deception and learn how to protect our heart from, from being seduced into the deceptive lies that are spreading through the world. In 1 first, in first Timothy, 1 first Timothy chapter 4, in verse number 1, it says, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, 
So this is, this is a clear revelation from the Holy Spirit that at the time of the end, there's going to be people that are going to believe lies. They're going to, they're going to give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. There'll be those speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And then in, in 1 Peter... I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1. Peter writes, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. So it matters if you believe lies. He goes on to say in verse 2, And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. The way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. So if I am seduced by false prophets or false teaching, if my, if my heart is open to error and believing things that are not true, it's going to put me on a path of destruction and take me off the path that God has for me. And the enemy, the devil, who's the father of lies, he is dedicated to propagating untruth. And he is committed to the cause of getting you to believe a lie. Go with me to the book of Matthew Chapter 7. I know I have you turning through some scriptures, but that's all right. We work our Bibles out on Wednesday night. Let your Bible stretch a little bit. In Matthew 7, Jesus says in verse 13, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. There are people who are on the wrong path. And if they don't get on the right path, they are not going to end up in heaven. And their life is not going to end up in the blessing that God has promised. But there is a path to heaven. There is a path to the blessing. There is a path to the promises of God coming to pass in a person's life. But it's a narrow path. And there's a few that find it. Well, I believe if, if, you come, if you're coming out to hear the word on Wednesday night, you're probably among the few that have found the right path. And if you're not, you're in the right place to get on the right path tonight. But look at what Jesus says in verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Think of the intensity of the language that Jesus, our Lord, our King, the Son of God is using when he when he is ministering this truth to us, beware of false prophets, false preachers, false ministers, false teachers. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Now, we live in a time 
where those of you that are just beginning your Christian walk, that you have to face you have to face obstacles to your Christian development, your spiritual development, that, that I didn't even have to face 20 years ago. Amen. Where if you're looking up something online, a Bible verse, for example, you read the Bible verse, you're looking it up, you're studying it, and then you come across a website or a YouTube video or social media post, with every unbelieving, deceptive lie that has ever been generated about that verse hitting you right in the face at the same time you're being exposed to the light of the Word. And I was thinking about young people, my daughter who, who is 15 years old and the youth. And, and if, if they come across a passage and get excited about it, and they go and they want to do some deep research on that passage that they're not just going to find teaching that is going to illuminate the truth, but they're going to find every way to twist it, every seed of false prophets and false teachers has the potential of contaminating it because we are so connected to the false views that are being propagated at a rate they've never been propagated before. And, I, and that, that's fresh on my mind because I was listening to the book of Revelation on YouTube, just letting it play for several days while I was getting ready listening to it. The Bible says, blessed is he who reads these writings in the book of Revelation. So I want to always have the book of Revelation getting in my heart because I want to be blessed. And so I was listening to it, and then uh, I, a couple days I just let it play. And then I went and I looked in the comments section a few days later, and I couldn't believe the trash that was there. And I was thinking, what if this was the first time someone was really trying to meditate in the Word and being exposed to that? And so Jesus said in the last days there will be times of deception, seducing spirits, and there'll be many false prophets. And so now, deception is multiplied at a level that previous generations didn't have to face. When I got saved in 1995, the internet, I think, may have just started with dial-up, but if I wanted to study the Bible, I had to get the books on my table with a dictionary and Strong's Concordance and read the books with a notebook and write it and meditate and study it. And I didn't hear what every atheist in the world had to say about that verse. I had time to, to, to meditate on his word and for the, the, the faith that the word produces to get rooted down in my spirit and build a, a strong foundation. But there are people now that they're going to have to work through some obstacles and protect their heart from deception if they're ever going to have that strong word foundation built in them. Because it's not enough to hear the word and hear the world. Because if I hear the world and, I, and I'm, I'm letting that mark my mind, then, this, then that's being planted in my spirit. And it will begin, if I'm not careful, to choke out the word that's getting implanted in my heart. So Jesus said, beware of false prophets. And here's what I want to encourage you in. Never let your faith waver because of a YouTube video. Amen. Never let your faith waver because somebody says something that is contrary to the truth that you know. If they knew what you knew, they wouldn't believe what they believe. If they had been sitting in Victory Life Church for the last year, they wouldn't be saying what they say. 
But most people that are coming against what you believe have not been exposed to the level of illumination that you've been exposed to. And so they may be very confident and loud about how confident they are, but they're very wrong. When somebody believes something, no matter what it is, whether it's truth or error, when it's believed, the way, our, the way we're made up, our heart, our inner man, our soul, our mind, it wraps a shield of negative emotion or emotion around what we believe. So when, I, when something contrary to what I believe hits against what I believe, there is an emotional reaction. For example, if you believe that financial prosperity is always bad, and then someone comes and shows you the promises in the Bible that Deuteronomy 8.18, my God, uh, remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth. Psalm 112, wealth and riches will be in the house of those that fear the Lord and delight greatly in his commandments. Psalm 1, if you meditate in the word, everything you do will prosper. And we go through the word to find all these promises of financial prosperity. But if you've been taught that, that if you have wealth, you can't get into the kingdom of heaven. Or that taking a vow of poverty is a sign of holiness... And then I come in and I say to you, God has a plan to prosper you in the financial arena. It's going to, it's going to create a negative emotion and a reaction because it's going against something you believe. And, and if, you never, if you never allow yourself to move past the negative emotions and keep, keep looking for the truth, then you're always going to be stuck where you are right now. And there's a lot of people, they just believe what they've always believed because the moment the word or the minister teaches something different than what I've always believed those negative emotions will cause people just to shut down. If you've never believed in healing, or let's say, for example, that you have been taught that God will make people sick and that he gets glory out of your suffering in sickness. And then someone comes along, Pastor Jason comes along, Pastor Phil comes along, Pastor Gill comes along, and says that Christ redeemed you from sickness. By his stripes you are healed. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The prayer of faith will heal the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. That God has revealed himself in Exodus as Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals all of our diseases. Psalm 103 says, Remember the Lord your God. Forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. So when that truth comes, you have to make a choice. Am I going to go with what I've been told by others or what I've always believed or am I going to lay hold of what I see in the written word of God? So Jesus said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. So they look like a sheep, but there's something else working on the inside of them. Inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs of thistles? In other words, in other words, Jesus is saying this. Don't let any man have an impact on your life until you see the fruit that's been produced in their life. Amen. 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 So I'm not, 
I'm not going to let what you say impact me because I haven't seen the fruit that what you believe has produced in your life yet. So you can't move me no matter how confident you are because Jesus said, look at what, what they're saying. You'll know them by their fruit. What has it produced in their life? So I can't be moved by a video you post on YouTube because I don't even know if you know how to be a good husband. I don't know if you know how to be a good father. I don't know if you're a person of integrity. So I'm not going to let, no matter how beautiful and how, how much money you put in the TV show, I'm not going to be moved by it because I've got to see, has your life produced the right fruit? That's why I want a pastor over my family that, has, that is seasoned in the word, that is solid in the word, and you can see the fruit of their lives. It would protect a lot of people from a lot of pain if they would just follow the Bible where it says that a novice should not be a pastor. You know, a lot of people come to church, get saved, get excited. They say, man, I, if, Jay, if Pastor Jason can do it, I know I can do it. And they say, I'm going to go start a church. And they've been saved for six months. And people do that. And sometimes they have charisma and they can speak well. And families will go and, and join to a novice. Even though the Bible says, not a novice a novice is not a, no, a novice in spiritual things. A novice in the word, a novice in ministry is not qualified to be a pastor or a bishop. Less, and, and Paul said it like this, lest they be, um, they fall into the temptation of the devil. They fall into a snare and, and, um, and the temptation of the devil. But yet people will go and submit to that. And tithe to that. And, and be all excited about it. It's the newest thing on the block. I'm going to this church. And, and then a year later, there's a scandal. You see something happen. And, and I'm all about planting churches. But plant it with somebody that's seasoned. I don't want you to do spiritual experiments on me to find out if you're a good pastor. <laughs> I want to know you're a good pastor. If my family's going to be under the anointing that's on your life. But people, we, we've seen it. You see it in the news. You see it in the world. You hold the stories. People will follow just about anybody. I'm shocked by what I see people follow. What you hear people say. You know, we, we, we should have some discernment. You know, we're blessed. The, the church that we have at Victory Life Church, we are, we are a blessed church with great pastors. Amen. And so, so I'm not going, I can't follow you if I don't see some godly fruit in your life. Did it work for you? You know, like someone giving you financial advice and they are, uh, can't even keep a job. I got a couple, a couple. Um, re well, never mind. They always want to give you the advice, and and just as broke as you can get. It's like if you are such a financial expert, where is the fruit of what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> And so, so we can, we can, we can judge, we can judge, is it truth and should my heart be open to it? And let, let me say this to you, the most popular verse in the world in a, a survey a few years ago, the most recognized verse is judge not. Anybody ever heard that verse, judge not? Did you know the way most people use that is a lie? 
that when they say, um, you know, everything wicked and wrong in the Bible and the Christian says that's wicked and wrong and they say, judge not. Well, well that is not the teaching of the Bible. Because listen, if God, is, if God has said it is wrong, he made the judgment. So if I say it's wrong because God said it's wrong, I'm not judging. I'm agreeing with the judgment that's already been made. So listen, we can judge a behavior as being wrong. What I cannot do, what I'm forbidden to do is judge the intent of your heart. I can't judge your heart. I can't say they meant to do that or they will never change. They will never, you know, I have to believe, I believe the best, yes, they're going to change. Well, they, they done backslid three times. Well, number four is going to stick. They said they were never going to do it again and they, and, and they did it again, but they said they're never going to do it again. Well, I believe they're never going to do it again. I can't judge the heart. God looks on the heart. But if you do something stupid, I can judge it and say that was stupid. And so people have twisted the scripture to say judge not that Christians should be silent about every abominable act that is happening in our civilization. And that is not true. Amen. And people are going to say, oh, you're being judgmental. Well, I'm agreeing with God on that. I'm agreeing with what God has already said is an abomination. Hallelujah. And if, that, if God upset you that he judged it, he is the judge. <laughs> he is the final judge. And did you not know Paul said that you're going to judge the angels? That the saints are going to judge the angels. And so Paul said, you should be able to judge little, th little things since you're going to be judging the angels. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you can, never, you can never take one verse and build a world view on it. Most people say judge not because they don't want you, um, uh, they just want to be comfortable in their sin. And you're not, you're not uncomfortable in your sin because I said it's wrong. You're uncomfortable in your sin because there's conviction on your spirit and God is working on you to try to bring you out of that. Let's see if we can move on to something a little better here. Let's see. Amen. Jesus said, beware. So, so how can I protect my heart from deception? You have to put forth an effort listen to me now, to protect your heart from deception. How do I do it? Number one, I spend time in the Word of God. I accept this belief that His Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His Word is the light in a dark world. His word is a lamp that shows me how to walk. It shows me how to think. It shows me what to believe. So his word is my light. That's number one. I spend time with his word, knowing his word is my light. And it's so easy to get caught up in being entertained that we neglect the feeding of our spirit on his word. You, we as believers, if we're going to be developed into the spiritual dimensions that God wants to take us into, listen to me, we must spend time in his word. We must spend time in his word. We've got to take time with his word every day. We've got to have time. We've got to have time with his word. And so the... We live in a generation now where it's not enough to just say the Bible says. You can, it's enough for you to say that to me, the Bible says. And if I see it in the Bible, then that's enough. But that's not enough for everybody. Because 
some people don't care what the Bible says. Why do we have such confidence in the Bible as the source of truth? Why do we believe it? Why do we anchor our eternal destinies, the confidence that God's word is true? Why do we accept it? Why do we believe it? Why do we anchor our lives in it? Well, it's not because we were always told the Bible's true. Because there are generations of families that was told the Quran is true. And there are, there are people who will, who will lay down their lives and die believing the Quran is true and the Quran was written by a false prophet. A deceived false prophet that had a fallen demon angel appear to him and probably had a supernatural encounter, but it was not a holy angel. You know, Muhammad says Gabriel appeared to him. And he had 70,000 heads. Each head had 70,000 mouths. Each mouth had 70,000 tongues. And each tongue spoke 70,000 languages. And he understood it all at once. And that's where he got the Quran and found out that Jesus was not the Son of God and that Allah has no son, which is anti-Christ. And, and Muhammad went into Mecca and Medina, killed all the unbelievers, beheaded them, instituted monotheism, slaughtered people, blood on Muhammad's sword, killed thousands of people. His followers killed thousands while he was alive, Muhammad. Started a religion. And, and people started to believe what he said. And when Muhammad's followers would come in on a city, listen to me. When Muhammad's followers would come in on a city, if you didn't embrace what they believed, you were going to be killed, tortured, lose everything you had. You had one option if you were going to live was to die or convert. And the foundation of a false religion was established. You know them by their fruit. Now that doesn't mean every, by no means that every Muslim wants to kill you, by no means. There are family people that believe Islam, but they're just deceived and we ought to pray for them. Not all of them want to kill you, but anybody that believes the Quran, literally, they want to kill you because it tells them to kill the unbeliever. The difference with us, if we believe it literally, or if we believe what Jesus said literally, then we love our enemies. We do good to them that hate us. We pray for them that despitefully use us. And so, one time I was talk, having a friendly conversation with a, with a, a Muslim man. Work, he worked at a convenience store. I would go in there on a regular basis and we would start talking. He loved to talk religion and I loved to talk the word. So. And we were respectful. And we were talking and, um, and he said, well, you know, the bottom line is you have Jesus and I have Muhammad, but it's basically the same. And I said, friend, I said, Muhammad went into Mecca and Medina and wiped out thousands of people, killed them and forced them to convert. And he said, he interrupted me and he said, yeah, but those were wicked people. And I said, and that's the difference with Jesus. He laid down his life for wicked people. Jesus died for sinners. And there are over 2 billion people around the world that confess Jesus as Lord and Jesus never took a person's life. His whole kingdom was built on love. And, and even now, sometimes you'll hear this. You'll hear people say, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. Has anybody ever heard that? Well, you look at the numbers. If you take an Islamic nation, you could say Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, or, and other nations. 
Indonesia. Everyone born in the nation is counted as growth to the Islamic faith. Because they grow by birth rate. If you're born in a Muslim home, you, they're not going to say, oh, they, they need to um, grow up, hear the gospel, confess Muhammad. No, you are a Muslim or you are in trouble. Everyone in the nation. So it's growing by birth rate. So there's some large population growth, but when they count the growth of Islam, they're counting it as birth rate. When you count growth by conversion, now listen to this, Christianity is growing at approximately overall something like 2 to 4% a year overall, which includes Catholicism, um, Anglicans, Lutherans, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, all the very um, what we call the formal liturgical churches. So all that together, including the evangelical, which would be the full gospel, word of faith, Holy Ghost, Pentecostal, Baptist, all the people who are preaching, those are mixed in there. The numbers are diluted by, like, the Catholics. But when you pull out the Baptists and the Pentecostals, it's growing at about 14% a year. The fastest By conversion, it's the fastest growing movement on earth. And you can go and look that up and confirm it. When you pull out just the Pentecostals, there are more Pentecostals right now than there are Buddhists in the earth, the fourth largest religion. But just Pentecostals by themselves, and it's growing somewhere around 15%, something like that, just the Pentecostals. And so when you, in other words, when you take out the ones that believe the literal interpretation of Scripture that believe in the gifts of the Spirit, that believe on the day of Pentecost they started speaking with other tongues, that that is the fastest growing religious movement on the earth today and has been for about a hundred years. And so you can't, you can't just believe everything you hear, especially when it's dealing with, with what you believe. Amen. Amen. So, so I, 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 I want to go back to what I was talking about Islam. There are people who believe it, the Quran, and they've been told their whole life that it's true. And some people will say, well, you know, what, how is that fair if that's all they ever believed? Well, let's track it back. You take a child right now in 2019 growing up in a home, all he ever hears is that the Quran is true, that God had no son, and that Muhammad is a prophet of God, a real prophet. Now, who... You have, you have Victory Life Church supporting missionaries around the world. You have Christian organizations around the world who will send Christians, missionaries, to that Muslim family and share the gospel. But... There are, to get that missionary to that Islamic stronghold, you got a government around them in many nations. You have a government around them that has set laws that forbid the conversion from Islam to Christianity. So the laws become so oppressive that it's not, God or the Christians that's stopping that young person from hearing the gospel, but it is a government that is believing lies that has put in a structure that stops them. And then you go back to the next generation and you track it all the way back to you have Muhammad, listen, Muhammad in the desert, in a cave, angel appeared to him, and this is... This is um, accepted by Muslims, no dispute on this part. Gabriel appeared to him, 70,000 heads, 70,000 mouths, and all that. Muhammad came out of that, went back to his wife and said, a demon appeared to me, and rejected the revelation. They later called it a revelation, and said, 
a demon appeared to me, told me I was the great prophet, that God had no son, because Muhammad was exposed to Judaism and Christianity. You can see how he borrows from it and all that. But he said, a demon appeared. But his wife said, that was, that was not a demon. Maybe you should listen to that. Kind of reminds me of um, Eve in the garden. You probably are a great prophet. You probably are. Follow it. And he started opening his heart to it and started a religion that's built on death, legalism, false view of God that has deceived millions. Just like Jesus said, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And that's just one. But Islam is one of the prophecies that Jesus gave. Now, I want to close with this. We don't believe the Bible just because we, told the, we were told the Bible was true. We believe the Bible because Jesus rose from the dead. And Jesus Christ is unique among every other individual that ever lived in history. There's nobody else who said, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to get back up from the dead. The greatest miracle in all the Bible, of all the miracles that happened, the one that our faith is anchored in is the fact that Jesus rose from the dead never to die again. Did you know in the book of Acts, they did not even have the New Testament yet. But they had a message that Jesus rose from the dead. And the Holy Spirit moved confirming what they was preaching with signs following, miracles, healing, signs and wonders, confirm the word. So we have a living faith, a living, a living, a living Savior that rose from the dead. So, because Jesus is the foundation of the living Christ Jesus, and he told me the word is true. You know, he quoted from the Old Testament. He told his disciples to go and preach the gospel. And so the foundation of this is a supernatural miracle of Jesus overcoming death. And now I can go to his word and anchor my heart in it. I can believe it. Praise God, because Jesus is alive. Stand with me. How do I protect my heart from deception? I got to spend time in the word. And listen, how do you protect your heart from deception? Be willing, listen to me, be willing to walk away from your opinion Every place it is different from the Word of God. If you will humble yourself to the Word and be willing to, to swallow your pride and say, you know, I thought, I thought this is the way it was, but I see in His Word this is the way it is. So I'm going... I'm walking away from what I believed and I'm going with the word and it'll protect my heart from deception. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Lord, I pray for our congregation here at Victory Life Church for a strong hunger for truth. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you stir up a passion and a burning desire for your word in the hearts of every person in this place. Lord, we long for your word. We long for a closer relationship with you. We long to, to live life in the truth and light of your word. And I pray for everyone here tonight that you give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Illuminate the eyes of their understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.